What's up, Crypto Street listeners? Do you use the internet? Of course you do. Did you know every time you go online, your information is unprotected? Probably not. It's true, though. Your passwords, emails, credit cards, and bank accounts are all exposed. You need a virtual private network or VPN to protect yourself. A VPN creates a private and secure internet connection for your device. But how do you find the right one when there are hundreds of VPNs out there? Luckily for you, VPN.com has spent thousands of hours visiting over 900 different VPN websites to make your search quick and simple. They've collected everything from pricing and features to device compatibility, making it easy to find the VPN that best fits your needs and budget. Plus, it's totally free. Visit VPN.com to find your VPN and start protecting yourself today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the main event. Let's go. Round one. Fight. Thank you for tuning in to the Crypto Street Podcast. Here are your hosts, Kim Whale, Prince, and Crypto Dale. And remember to tip your waitress. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to Crypto Street Podcast. I am your co-host, Crypto Dale. As always, I'm joined with my fellow cohorts, Killer Whale out in sunny LA. How we doing, Killer? Hey, doing well. How about you guys? Can't complain. Can't complain at all. Uh, Prince, what's good up in Canada, homie? Uh, nothing much, you know, just another day in paradise. So, good day overall. What's Bitcoin? Bitcoin going to do Bitcoin? something here in the next couple of day or it's what? gonna do something what's it's gonna do i don't know yet yeah. but it's gonna do something Mil- million dollar question <laughs> um so today's today's podcast we're joined fortunate enough to be joined by a couple guys from the xyo project um we're joined with marcus levin he's the co-founder and head of operations and then johnny kolasinski is the head of media so fellas um let's start off thanks again for taking the time and joining with us um, let's start off by each of you guys kind of giving a little background of of yourself, and then we can dive into XY. All right. Well, I'm Johnny Kolosinski. I'm the head of media. I've been working with XY since 2015. Uh, g- got into crypto around 2013, uh, uh, mining and trading Bitcoin. Uh, hi, I'm Mark Slevin, and I joined a little later than Johnny, but uh, the three co-founders together, we, we worked in some combinations in other businesses. Uh, we sold maybe four businesses over the last six years and uh, started some Bitcoin mining in 2013, which wasn't profitable enough at that time. So we created a distributed computing company out of that. And uh, Ari, um, the CEO of the company and CTO, he start, he worked uh, on this location project. And uh, so I joined a little later here. Awesome. So just tell us a little bit about, you know, the kind of foundations of the XY Findables project, the history of that, and how that ties in with the XYO network. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Ari uh, got started in, uh, founded the company in 2012, uh, right as the Bluetooth LE protocol started uh, started making waves. And we launched our uh, first Bluetooth item finder on Kickstarter in 2014. Uh, we're now on the fourth iteration of that product. Uh and have also launched a GPS and GSM, so cellular-enabled uh, tracker as well. And between the two of those, we've manufactured about a million devices. Uh, and we realized as there were more and more crypto hobbyists in the audience or in the uh, office last year, uh, hey, we th- as we learned more about Ethereum and smart contracts and the one thing that was lacking, it, hey, this thing that we're spending all of our spare time on uh, we're in the position to change the space. Marcus, you want to talk a little bit about the XYO network? Yeah, definitely. So um, as we gathered more and more devices, we also gathered more and more data. And uh, one of the previous companies we worked on was a data company. So we had a pretty good understanding that the actual business is in the data, not in the device. And uh, out of that, the XYO network was born. Uh, which builds on top of our IoT business. What it does, it uh, decentralizes location data. So right now you have uh, GPS, and uh, GPS is a centralized source of location which is easily spoofed or hacked. For example, uh, during the Pokemon Go craze, all the kids just downloaded uh, GPS spoofing apps (laughs) to get their rare Pokemons or... uh, (laughs) That's what my brother did. He didn't leave the house once. He was out 
kit in the mall and he just sat in his bedroom. Exactly, exactly. Uh, or a few years back, uh, there were some stories that uh, Iranians allegedly took down an American drone just by setting up the wrong uh, GPS signal. The drone drone thought it was uh, at wow. the base and landed. And because of that, uh, today's applications on top of location are navigational and not transactional. You wouldn't order yourself something to your house and then trigger an automatic payment, which is irreversible. And uh, we thought to change that by creating certainty around location data. And the only way you can create cer- certainty is if you have a lot of different sources which are independent of each other. Uh, in comes blockchain uh, with its decentralized nature. And uh, so we take our devices and create something like a mesh network where the different devices can recognize uh, if they are in proximity to each other. And the more devices you have, the more accurate things become as well. Uh, It's like uh, us five taking a selfie together. We print out five copies, uh, put our signatures on there. We believe each other. We can prove that we have been close to each other. It works very, very similar to that. And... uh, you have now, as you create certainty around applications, you have uh, a number of applications. For example, you could uh, um, have payment up and delivery for e-commerce. Amazon could offer their prime customers that you only pay when the product is at your doorstep or actually if it's in your living room. So how it works is uh, you would put an RFID chip or an other similar cheap chip into the Amazon packaging tape and your connected doorbell Tesla lens the driveway, your neighbor's cell phone, the smart meter down the road, all of those things would recognize the packages there and the payment to Amazon gets triggered. Uh, one third of Americans experienced porch theft in 2016 and you don't know if it was the UPS guy scanning the package but actually taking it back or your neighbor took it or someone ran off with it. Uh, so it's a huge problem uh, which we solve here. Um, but that's not only one. We have I think now we have thousands of different use cases <laughs> we can mm-hmm. uh, pull off, but we, we try to build the platform layers. You know, you can make sure the kids arrived safely at school, for example, and went there with their friends and took the route you wanted them to take. Or um, uh, I speak with one of the big hotel review sites. They're telling me they lose their users because uh, the hotels become too good to, to put up fake reviews and the users don't trust the reviews anymore. If you could prove someone flew from... Uh, Iowa to San Diego, stayed at a certain hotel for two weeks and then flew back and uh, suddenly you have a location verified review, especially if that person has a history of doing that. Or uh, about two weekends ago, we had a hackathon in our office with the city of San Diego, uh, their smart city initiative, uh, some IoT people and 120 hackers. And in San Diego, we have connected uh, smart meters and smart traffic lights. They build applications where they imagine that every car in San Diego would be a, a Sentinel, one of the, our location verification devices. And if that would be true, then you could, uh, for example, optimize parking and traffic flow. So if a car goes into a parking spot and uh, the, the meter and all the other Sentinels around it would show it as occupied, so you could send it to an app, 90% of all parking spots are occupied here. You know, you just leave the car, it pays the meter, by the minute in XYO, so you go back into the car, you go back into the traffic, and the traffic flow gets analyzed, uh, gets sent to a traffic management system, gets analyzed there, and you optimize the red-green phases uh, and solve traffic flow issues. Or you could even attach it to a rudimentary AI because it's so much data and, uh, and solve traffic problems before they exist. That's all today. But uh, in a world of tomorrow, in five to ten years, full of AIs, and robots, smart cities, safe driving cars, and drones, all those things rely on transactional location data. Nobody's really providing that today, and we want to be that standard of the future. So let's start, I guess, by just breaking down the sentinels that you mentioned, which um, I believe are the hardware devices scattered throughout the world that relay and transmit location data. Um, and explain kind of how that works, You know how those form the bedrock of the XYO network. First, can I say how happy it is to be having one of these conversations with someone that's had the white paper, that's read the white paper? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's uh, dense. It's very yeah. dense, but uh, it, it, the picture is starting to come together, and I'm sure more so with your guys' help. Uh, so the Sentinels, like you said, are the hardware devices that, that 
form the backbone of the network. Uh, and each of them record heuristic data about what's going on based partly on the need for your use case. So if it was uh, a supply chain for a restaurant, it might want, want to record not just location and movement, but temperature. Uh, but the most important thing about them is that they also record their interactions with all of the other sentinels that they encounter. And each of them records those uh, that information separately on their own ledgers. That's how you pre prevent spoofing, because each of those devices uh, have a immutable record of everything else they've seen and when. So you can uh, you compare the ledgers of every device uh, in order to, to provide certainty in the location that you've gathered. May I also add that uh, it's not only our own devices. We have a million there which are the foundation of our network. And we are working on a bunch of partnerships with other IoT companies, um, uh, mobile OEM deals, and mobile app distributors, and could be an SDK in, in any type of app because um, we'll get to that, I think, but we, we provide the monetization tool basically as well. So with all the, the partnerships we're talking uh, with right now, we would be well over 100 million daily active users uh, once they're closed. So that's really um, the amount of devices out there that service Sentinels is really key to the issue of how accurate the data transmission is and how effectively, I guess, the network works. Um, mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you're going to have more and more devices out there. Are these devices, to kind of draw on some real-world examples, are they anything from like stationary um, established devices combined with moving devices? And I know that kind of plays into the accuracy of their information. Um, so go into a little bit of the different types of Sentinels, perhaps. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we, we mentioned our existing IoT company of, of Bluetooth item finders, which are mobile devices or moving devices uh, based on and working with a mobile app. Uh, but we also have for other projects that we that that we experimented with, but were slightly before their time as far as the Bluetooth tech goes. We rolled out ten thousand stationary beacons in San Diego and businesses all over the county, uh, and use we can use the the knowledge that we have from creating that network to create networks all around to to build out that mesh network. Uh, a lot of the stationary devices would also be bridges. Uh, those are what report the, the information from Sentinels uh, to the blockchain. Uh, because they're stationary, they'll be encountering a lot of different uh, different devices, uh, different Sentinels, which uh, will give weight to every device that they've encountered as far as uh, the certainty of the data that they're providing. Uh, and uh, by seeing those interactions with the static bridges, uh, you've got, A, both a known point to transmit the information that the Sentinels have stored, and B, uh, a more secure and more um, uh, data that you know is going to be reliable in its validity. So talk a little bit about um, one of the quotes, I'm taking this from the white paper, is the vulnerability of current crypto location technologies revolves around the devices that report back an object's location. In smart contracts, this data source is an oracle. So maybe talk about that weakness um, and how you guys have aimed to um, solve some of those problems inherent to location-based blockchain applications? Um, so uh, the, the weakness is, uh, and I'm, I'm going to preface this with I'm not a developer, so I'm going to be speaking from, a, from, from not a deep knowledge, uh, but the weakness is in part a, a one of reliability of data. Uh, and how do you know that this device that is, that is saying, that is, this oracle uh, is reporting data that is accurate? And that is why we built out the concept of bound witness that I was speaking about uh, previously. That uh, that uh, where the being able to compare the historical data of many different devices and their interactions uh, gives validity uh, to the data that is that that you're that is being reported. And so, go ahead. So it's uh, it's basically you build a reputational ledger. So if uh, you keep telling the truth, uh, or your answers are very probable, you build reputation over time. And as you lie, you lose reputation. As you lose reputation, you become less relevant for the network. And uh, you, we also do is you have to stake some XYO tokens against your answers. So uh, if, if you lie, uh, you lose those XYO tokens. And but if you answer, if you tell the truth and your answer is part of uh, your data is part of an answer um, to some question like where's my package for example, uh, then you earn XYO tokens. 
So you are incentivized to tell the truth. So there is more vulnerability in the network, the less data points you have. Uh, you know, you create less certainty. And we will, as we give answers, we will uh, give that certainty score back. You know, and it, that might not matter to you if you order yourself $3 worth of socks, then uh, maybe you just need to have 50% certainty that, that uh, you know, the socks are really uh, in your living room or on your porch. But uh, if, you, if you order yourself a $200,000 car, uh, you want to make damn sure that it's in the garage and the garage door is closed before the payment gets triggered. Right? And uh, so uh, um, what we also try to do is we try to incentivize uh, the bread, breadth and density of the network. So we, in, like I said, we incentivize people to put up the sentinels or to be sentinels that earn XYO tokens. And uh, we actually have four components. The Sentinels are only one part of the components. But if you ask a question into the system, then uh, maybe 30% of that bounty gets paid to the Sentinels. And if there are only two Sentinels, let's say, each Sentinel gets 15% of the overall bounty. But if there are 10 Sentinels, each Sentinel gets 3%. And uh, this way, we, we uh, try to find the vulnerability through... Uh, incentivizing people to have more density somewhere. Um, so you you touched on, you just mentioned how there's actually like, there's four components to it all. You got the sentinels, you got the bridges, but what we haven't really touched on too much is the archives, uh, the archivists and the diviners. Hopefully I'm saying this right because I'm terrible for pronunciation. Uh, <laughs> well, why don't we, yeah, why don't we go into a little bit more on those uh, last two because we've kind of talked about the sentinels and the bridges a little bit, but not too much on the other two. Yeah, the, well, the uh, bridges, like it, like we said, report the data to the mm -hmm. blockchain. The archivists are the nodes that are uh, uh, receiving, processing, uh, indexing, and storing the information uh, received from uh, from the bridges. Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously, you need you need the data that's that that is being transmitted to be stored in a way that can be easily accessed. Uh, and so that that's the role of the archivist. There, they are the bookkeepers of the system. Uh, diviners, uh, Marcus mentioned that you're, ask, you're asking a query of the network. Mm -hmm. Where is my thing and how did it get there? Uh, or um, it, or uh, what doctors interacted with this patient and what drugs were administered? Uh, the, uh, and you want to know with a varying level of certainty, uh, it, possibly as much as possible, but that's expensive, uh, or and affordable because you're asking lots of questions. Um, so the diviners uh, take all of the information from the archivists uh, and uh, determine what, what's the best answer, the one that seems to be both the most certain and most, most recent uh, it, uh, answer to the question that's been asked. May I also add that our system is completely decentralized, so uh, we don't need to run one server uh, to, to make this work. Uh, now, in the beginning, of course, you know, we need to kick things off here and there, so there's going to be a little bit more, like, centralized control, but, uh, um, you know, it's running right now, and as, as we scale it, you know, it's going to be completely decentralized. So the, the archivists are actually a distributed computing system or storage system on people's personal computers, um, you know, and they earn tokens for that. And... Uh, the, the diviner algorithms are a, a little he heavier, so that they're more like uh, Ethereum uh, uh, transaction processing. So you need more specialized type of equipment. But uh, overall, it's uh, completely decentralized. So is the network sort of... Um, I, I remember seeing that the diviners especially have a proof-of-work um, element to them because, like you said, their computations are more transactionally or they're more you know computationally heavy. Um, is there a proof of stake component or is it all just kind of proof of work and then the, the rewards are divvied up in such a manner that the diviners get a little bit extra over the other three sections? The Sentinels are actually a proof of stake slash proof of work. <laughs> you know, like you need to stake to be able to earn back, uh, but you need to provide some work to, to mm -hmm. earn, which is providing location verification data. And uh, the others are uh, proof of work. Concept. Okay. And these fit in under the category that you guys are operating with is a, a proof of origin 
system, correct? Uh, proof of origin is, uh, is what we refer to as that, is what we use to refer to the reputation. Okay. Uh, it, it, it's, it, uh, your proof of origin score, your reputation score, uh, will weigh heavily into, uh, it, it, into how likely it is that the information you provide is, is involved in that, that best answer. So a higher uh, proof of origin score makes it more likely you'll get a, a part of the, of the bounty. So based on my reading, it seems like there's so much data just going back and forth in this network. Um, I guess what are some of the challenges you guys either have found already or that you see perhaps in the future um, towards making this big you know, network of all this data going in tons of different directions, kind of making that flow and making that work? Yeah, it's exactly right. You know, it's a ton of data. So to be able to make the data flow work is going to be difficult to store all that data and then to be able to readily access it. Uh, However, we, we have a bunch of experience with that. Uh, I mentioned in the beginning that uh, we built a distributed computing network before, um, which was similar to Berkeley's open infrastructure network, which is around for more than 10 years, I think. And uh, um, ours was, was similar to that. Uh, we actually went out of Bitcoin mining into helping with cancer research at the University of Washington. And... Uh, 1% of our computing and processing power, 150x their uh, capabilities. And uh, we found some interesting uh, molecules, you know, that, like to assist in their cancer research. And, uh, you know, then we offered this to big pharma companies and hedge funds for their uh, data problems. And uh, so we know pretty well how to handle data and uh, how to store it and how to distribute it. We had another uh, data company which we sold to 1010 Data of New York and uh, we were a little naive when we started it but uh, became quite experts over the years. And uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a huge challenge. It's probably the biggest challenge we have is to handle all that data. So jumping off of that, I know you mentioned that San Diego is sort of the hub. You're based in San Diego, California um, and that you have mm -hmm. a number of Sentinels active in that community. Is that been, has that been sort of the, part of the strategy is starting and kind of dominating a small community and then going outward and using that as sort of an example to expand further? Or how has that kind of gone? What's the thought process behind that? Yep, that's exactly right. Because we have lots of density here in San Diego, um, our network is, uh, is, uh, is more functional here. Mm -hmm. you know, it's functional everywhere, but here we have higher certainty, more data flow, and so on. Um, that's why we started out in our office and vicinity, and uh, then, you know, we go broader and broader. So the idea is San Diego and then uh, probably U.S., uh, and then it depends on the partnerships. We're going to close uh, over the next few months, you know, where that network is. For example, I speak with a smart uh, electricity meter company where you prepay your electricity uh, in uh, lesser developed infrastructure places and uh, where you don't have much cell phones or any kinds of uh, electronic payment forms. And uh, you try to prepay the meter and then people can use it at their houses. So uh, it, it could be from, the, from there, you know, basically it could go anywhere is what I'm saying. You know? But uh, the more density we have uh, with our devices, the better the network will work. Cool. So let's talk a little bit more about some potential use cases. Um, maybe just kind of go in detail about how one might work. I know you mentioned package delivery um, with something like Amazon and making sure that, you know, a package has been delivered to you. Um, talk a little bit about like kind of some real world examples and, and just kind of a little bit more about, because um, it seems like it's a very dense project. You know, it's mm -hmm. going to be, mm -hmm. um, I, I think it, it takes a little bit of time for it all to kind of come together. But then when it does, it looks very nice. But talk a little bit more about some real world examples um, and perhaps the addressable market for services like this. Uh, real world example. So the uh, before we were working in the blockchain side of things, uh, XY worked with, and I can't go into super deep specifics, but we worked with a uh, national security organization for securing firearms uh, in in high security areas, and uh, essentially in knowing where they were when. Uh, based on what we did with that project, uh, we could have not just a where is this firearm in this high security location but also a chain of possession that is auditable and immutable. immutable. Uh, where was this when, with whom, uh, where did it go, when did it come back? Uh, and all of that is uh, auditable, immutable, and not dependent on 
uh, on an individual reporting properly. Okay, so talk a little bit now. That does that help form the XYO main chain? Is that um, kind of break down that main chain and what information that comprises and the role it plays in the larger ecosystem? Uh, as Johnny said, we, we are both not developers, but the 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 reason for us having the main chain is uh, because uh, Ethereum and a lot of other chains are, are slow, too slow for IoT devices and too slow for. Uh, microtransactions, like the billions of transactions we speak about, uh, you, you can't just run on, on top of Ethereum. That's uh, why we developed uh, our own main chain, and that's why uh, one of uh, the chief developers on our team, Raul Jordan, uh, is on our team. And he he uh, is trying to solve the scalability problem of Ethereum uh, with Prismatic Labs. It's his company. They do something in the sharding technology space. And they just won a prize from the Ethereum Foundation, or he won the prize, actually. Um, and they fund his uh, research. So everything we do with our XYO main chain is focusing on this scalability and reduction of, of transaction costs to make it feasible for uh, IoT devices and uh, you know, transactions between mobile phones. And the gentleman you just mentioned, uh, Raul, I think is his name, he is a, a, a Teal Foundation fellow, if I recall. Yes, he's a, he's a Teal Foundation fellow. He was uh, it, one of our first three advisors, first yep. five advisors, definitely, um, and was heavily involved in uh, putting together our white paper and uh, uh, it, it, taking what we had on the IoT side of things and uh, as crypto crypto enth- the, uh, the crypto enthusiasts on our team mm-hmm. and saying oh here's what's coming up down the line uh he, he, here's what's not just new but here here's what's coming because he's got he was he's so so deep in yeah for people who don't know the the teal foundation that's a really really cool program that basically incentivizes people to not necessarily take the traditional route of going to college for four years going to grad school for another four um, or however, you know, whatever the, the kind of main path for a lot of people in the U.S. was. But it gives people funding to pursue these ideas that have real-world applications um, sooner than they'd probably be able to if they were going the traditional route. Um, so it's interesting mm-hmm. to see that kind of manifest into a real-world application like with this, yeah. which is, I mean, you look at this and the use cases really seem endless. I mean, um, I know you give some examples, obviously, but it's like, I think this is the sort of thing too, where as time goes by, you know, and people know that this is even available as an option, the amount of use cases are just going to multiply really quickly. Um, mm-hmm. So with that we, in mind... We were just at a, a convention in San Francisco and, you know, spoke to it, uh, probably spoke to a thousand people and got a hundred new use cases. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. literally, I've been sitting here and that's all that's been going through my mind. It's like, wow, this is just, <laughs> this is getting so much bigger than when I was just reading the white paper. It's like, holy crap, you know. Um, so you guys have a crowd sale approaching. Um, and now as every, you know, token purchaser is kind of interested in, you guys have some, a lot more incentives for the token users than say the average uh, crypto project might have. So why don't we go into more about the incentives that, uh, you know, XYO offers uh, for token users. And then also to branch off more onto that is go into the crowd sale info and when all that's going to be going down. Um, what do you mean exactly by incentives for the, can you, for the token users? So, uh, uh, you know, they decide they want to go um, make a transaction. I guess they want to get some data. Um, they want to use your platform. Um, how is that all going to work with them? The incentives above and beyond, there's the person, personal use case for so many of our Sentinels. Right. Uh, and uh, so connecting to, you know, having the thing that finds your keys also be making your money in, uh, yeah. in your pocket or on your desk. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, I think that's, that's a big one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just the, as you have varied use cases, like for example, the building out the uh, paying for parking, yeah. uh, the tool that's paying your parking is also making you money based on all of the, well, making you XYO, uh, I should, uh, uh, based on everything that's going on around it. So okay. something, so aspects that have a, a real world use case to you uh, all of a sudden have that crypto economic incentive. Right. Again, uh, I mentioned at the beginning that it could also be an SDK into like a mobile game, for example. So instead of, you know, yourself buying a thousand farmable points or, you know, watching that rewarded video to get to the next level, you could just agree 
become a sentinel. Mm -hmm. And uh, so along the way, you earn XY tokens, which yeah. then allow you, you know, to level up or you, to exchange them for fumble points. Or uh, we, we think uh, with our IoT partners, we think about, uh, you know, the, it's a solar model. So in solar, you can either buy the entire equipment uh, for a high price uh, outright, and you own it, you own the electricity which gets produced, or um, you can uh, buy the equipment at a reduced price or mm -hmm. only pay for installations and so on. Uh, right. But the electricity is owned by someone else. Mm -hmm. um, so if you buy your new LG fridge, let's say they have some connected fridges, uh, you could get 20% off if yeah. LG earns the XYO tokens, which the fridge earns. So in a sense, this is almost, um, in my mind, um, a way of monetizing IoT and Internet of yeah. Things, um, where not only do you have, you know, something that it's like you have a, a monitor within your, your uh, let's say, your fridge when you need a replacement water filter, but you can then use that, you know, the technology implemented in that to also earn XYO tokens by transmitting that data location and serving as a sentinel on the network. Is that an accurate representation at all? It was it was beautiful. <laughs> okay, great. Good, <laughs> Good job, IoT. killer. Oh, well, I'm trying. Write but, that uh, one down. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it, again, like, it, addressable market. I mean, I, insane, I think I saw right? maybe… It's so big. It seems gigantic. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, it's just it's it's like crazy to try to wrap my head around all the different uses this could possibly entail. Um, and, and again, I think it's not even going to be clear until the technology is you know out there and people are aware that this is even possible. Um, so talk a little bit perhaps about the proceeds of the crowd sale, um, what that will go towards. I think one thing mentioned was um, furthering of scaling technology within Ethereum, like sharding, you know, Casper with proof of stake. So talk a little bit about the the crowd sale and the proceeds. Um, and how that's going to go towards building the network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we started our crowd sale two days ago, and uh, things are complicated uh, because I spoke maybe with 23 lawyers along the way. And, uh, <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> and uh, a lot of different opinions led us uh, to this uh, complicated way we do things, but uh, to reduce, you know, the risk, not only for us, but also for all the token buyers and, you know, to hopefully uh, maximize uh, the potential. So we have started out crowd sale two days ago, but we have uh, different ways to buy things for accredited, for non-accredited, for overseas investors. Overseas, we look at a high number of different jurisdictions. It's complicated. So based on where you're from and what you do when you land on our website, it might act a little differently. And uh, so you can even buy a uh, complete real equity. Uh, if you're an unaccredited investor, we offer you equity in our company, uh, which is great because for every token we sell, we allocate one to the company. So that means that for every dollar which comes in, uh, we get also a dollar asset on the books. So for equity holders, that's great, mm -hmm. especially for... Uh, People, you know, who have a longer-term outlook or, you know, look for longer-term liquidity type things. And uh, so we try to scale right now the token sale and the equity sale. And uh, we're going to use the proceeds to uh, increase the scale and density of our network. And, you know, to build those types of partnerships, uh, to build out our technology team. And the yeah, engineers are very expensive. Someone just told me um, that for every... Open for every blockchain engineer, there are 14 open uh, blockchain positions. Yeah, so, and that too. <laughs> so they're really difficult to get, they're very expensive. And uh, if you want the top people, you need to pay top dollars. So a lot of those funds will mm -hmm. go to that development. And then uh, uh, it's all about then building out the partnerships and the communities. And uh, I, I mentioned in the beginning that we look at this five, 10 years horizon. So our technology is viable today, and it becomes more viable as our network grows. But uh, in five to ten years, the use cases are going to be infinite. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, to make it to this five to ten year mark, you know, we, we need to raise a large amount of uh, money or cryptocurrency and put it in our reserves. And uh, and we are. Um, there's inevitably going to be volatilities uh, in the cryptocurrency market, as we saw between mid-December and now, mm -hmm. you know, what happened. Um, it might go even worse. You know, cryptocurrencies might mm -hmm. 
not banished from our eye, but be irrelevant maybe for half a year or a year, you yeah. know, mm-hmm. to make it through this type of of uh, volatility, uh, uh, we need, need to have a large amount of reserves. Uh, well, you, asked, you just want to point out, so uh, the breakdown of, of where the funds is going is, we do have that all on our website. Uh, the majority, the vast majority of it is towards uh, the development of the network and then the uh, the uh, bringing on partnerships, because that's, like, like we've said many times, uh, the, the more participants we have involved, the, the stronger the network is going to be, especially early on. Uh, but five percent of everything that we're bringing in is going to be towards funding uh, uh, other projects uh, around around supporting the uh, the crypto space. And that's one of the main things I really liked about this project is that it's based basically, you know, on a foundation of a company that already exists, already has had success with X Y Findables. You see so many projects coming around just trying to capitalize on the ICO gold rush because mm. there's so much capital flowing into the space. Yeah. But a lot of them don't have a use or they're kind of stretching for, you know, it being a practical thing in the real world. Um, one of the common themes I see in your white paper is one of the first real world applications of blockchain and sort of enabling the physical world to act like an API de- for developers. Um, and it, it, we can kind of see that just looking at how it works and all the different possibilities. Um, so it's nice to see something. And I think that'll help too with getting all the connections and everything that are necessary to really grow this in scale is the partnerships developed previously with the business you've already kind of developed and established. So um, it's very interesting to see that. I think it's a great thing. I think the, pro- the space needs more projects like this. Yeah, I, I totally agree and echo that. Uh, the one thing that really caught my eye on the whole deal was the amount of time served or time put in on the team. You know, it's a lot of the guys that... A lot of guys. You guys have a big have, team too. Yeah, huge team. Many years of experience on them. Um, kind of one thing that I like to look at when I'm investing in a project is is the team and and what uh, kind of experience they have. So that was that was really one of the first things that stood out to me. Yeah, we get asked all the time, "What do you look for in a new project?" And I think something we all go back to is team because you want to know that you're kind of putting your funds with people who have a vested interest, people who are used to having successful projects in the past because they have reputations to upkeep. You know. Right. Um, and that's extremely important. Um, so I think you guys have that in spades. I mean, for all of our listeners, go out there and check out the team page. It's not only lengthy, but the amount of success these guys have had in previous ventures is really, really impressive. Um, and so it's just, it's even the website I really like, I think is like, and I think that's yeah, a that's big great. thing too, because you go to some of these projects and the website's like, it was created in the mid nineties. And it's like, Jesus, <laughs> like, this is so ugly. Um, it's but funny. Yours is really nice looking. To touch on like how you mentioned, like a lot of ICOs we've seen in the past where they're kind of just money grabs. But now I think we're in an environment where those kind of people, they can't really get away with it anymore. Um, because now there is a lot of regulatory bodies kind of watching over, right? So, and even you guys mentioned how how much time you've had to put in with the lawyers and all that. You know, to the people listening, you know, this is this is stuff you like to hear because it means it's uh, very legit. <laughs> it's- <laughs> uh, one thing I'd like to point about, kind of, it, it's been a strategy of X Y, or I, I guess less of a strategy and more of an ethos. Uh, is that uh, for our pre-sale, we didn't have a pre-sale where we reached out to a bunch of uh, VC firms that were looking at, at throwing our money mm-hmm. into crypto space because that's what we heard about all in, all last year. Uh, it's uh, our pre-sale. Instead, we had about a two and a half week period where we opened up uh, the pre-sale to a few crypto enthusiast groups. Mm-hmm. And uh, so uh, instead of having uh, five or six uh large whales yeah. in the space. Uh, we had 500 participants that mm-hmm. we raised 1,900 Ether from, and the majority of them were in the, the one to three range. Yeah. Uh, nice. These these were folks that, that believed in what we were doing yeah. and not just uh, uh, be- believed in the idea of of crypto as an investment. Yeah, we, we, it was 2,300 people we marketed that that to, and 500 of them put it in. And like the conversion rate is, is just Ooh, incredible. Yeah, it was a very international crowd. It was a Facebook group and a Telegram group, and mm-hmm. uh, very international. And those are the people who are gonna build applications on top of it, and they are wearing your t-shirts and your hats later, and uh, you can say right, your grandma with her five dollars got the same. Tim Draper gets, mm. you know, is his <laughs> billion dollars. <laughs> it's a good example. I like that. One. That's a great example. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Um, so just kind of piggybacking off of the crowd sale, um, I guess the roadmap is readily available on your website, but for everybody listening to this, uh, perhaps just pick out a couple of the most important things you have in line for the roadmap for um, the, set, the last three quarters here of 2018, and perhaps maybe some things you're aiming for for 2019 as well. Uh, yeah, sorry, we're pulling up the date so that we make sure that we're accurate here. Okay, all good. <laughs> um, so we've got the, the main net coming a little bit later this year. Uh, the test net and the main main net coming Q2 and then uh, a Q, Q3 or Q4 of this year. And then uh, our next step as far as the hardware side of things is make it so we've, we've got these million uh, Bluetooth devices and uh, GPS, GSM devices. But adding something that uh, that can serve as a Sentinel that isn't at that, that's at an affordable manufacturing uh, point and so an affordable sale point for us and to build people out. So we've got NFC stickers. Uh, coming later this year, which will be kind of where you get to the, we can have these everywhere quickly and easily. And then from there, uh, it's it's bringing on the partnerships is, is the big priority for the next 18 months. Yeah. It's, uh, also, it's, it's uh, important for us to, to get some of those during the crowd sales. Sale. Our crowd sale runs for two months. We started two days ago. Or days yeah. Ago. <laughs> We've been traveling a lot, so it's actually been four days. <laughs> 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 I was uh, no. I flew from here to Austin, uh, New York, Puerto Rico. Whew. Was home for twenty hours because the meeting got canceled. Kissed uh, my two kids and my wife. Flew on to Hong Kong, then flew to San Francisco and just came from the airport here to speak with you guys. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank your wife and um, kids. We also have a, a Marcus roadmap for the next eighteen months. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, but Basically, it's all about these partnerships now. You know, right. so that's what people want to see. And that's what we want to see. It's, it's going to make us so much more viable. And then it allow we have the chicken and egg problem right now, right? Like, build out the central network and build applications on top of that. And uh, if we can uh, have a critical scale in the Sentinel network, uh, it's so much easier to build, up, uh, build out applications on top of it. So it's one of our top priorities. Okay, so I guess um, you know for all the audience out there, how can they follow along to with the project? Where can they find you? You know, you can plug your website, Telegram group you might have, Twitter, all that. Yeah, actually, so those are the best channels to follow us. Uh, yeah, Johnny is there not in Twitter. I think he doesn't sleep anymore. Yeah, uh, it, 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 the easiest way to it, it, probably the Telegram group, group yeah. uh, t.me slash xyo network. Um, I'm in there. Uh, Quite often. <laughs> Trust me, you know we the know the feeling. <laughs> yeah. yeah, oh, I'm sure you do. Never get away from it. <laughs> and then Twitter, it's at XY Oracle Network. Instagram, the same. And Facebook is XYO Network. Uh, but we also do have a, a subreddit. We've been focusing more heavily on, on Telegram, but uh, you can see a lot of uh, what people have been saying about us and what, what other people have been writing about us and that sort of thing in our subreddit, r slash XYO network. It's easy to get sucked into the Telegram rabbit hole, isn't it? Oh. Like we often joke around oh. that we feel like we, we live on Telegram basically. And it's like <laughs> we just escape every now and then to eat, you know, and do stuff like that. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, flights have been fantastic because I haven't had internet. <laughs> <laughs> Until, until you, turn until it on, you, you land, can, yeah. I was just going to say, tons of notifications. You like, oh, notifications. I got to catch up with all of this. <laughs> like the dread sets in, you know, of all the <laughs> potential things you've missed. <laughs> but it's a it's a problem as well, right? Because you get so dragged into that. You know, we love our community; it's our top priority. But it also makes it difficult for you to strategize mm. in order to put announcements mm -hmm. out there, you know, on Twitter or to yep. work on the next PR and press release kind of thing. Because you're in this constant conversation, so consuming. And we have help. Yeah. So yeah. we, we have, uh, we work with a community agency. They have about 60 people, you know, which work on our Telegram as well. Mm -hmm. We have a Telegram in Chinese, Korean, Japanese, uh, we have Spanish. And uh, we, so we work with community agencies uh, around the globe, but uh, we're still in there, especially Johnny is in there 24-7. <laughs> All right, well, um, guys, unless you have anything else you want to want to talk to, I think we've got all of our questions wrapped up. I think um, I mirror all three of us when I say that we think this is a fantastic project. Uh, we like what you guys are doing. Um, I'm, I'm a little excited to watch this unfold and see how you guys handle it. I think it has, um, like we've said on the show, it has a million use cases. 
Um, I can't wait to see what you guys come up with. So if you have anything else you want to want to share, you know, go ahead. Uh, well, uh, folks that are going to be in Santa Clara or in the Bay Area the first week of April uh, can join us at, is that one the GB blockchain? Yeah, yep. Uh, GB blockchain, I think April 2nd through 4th. And we do actually have a handful of uh, of free passes to that we, that we can give away. So uh, you can toss, I'll, I'll, we'll set up an email for your folks, uh, an email address that you can toss in the show notes. Uh, if they want to want to join us there, we'd be happy to give them a, a pass to that and see Marcus and I uh, uh, talk live. That'd be great. Um, we'll also sh- throw in the... Uh telegram ad you know your telegram group and stuff like that so if you're listening um look in the description on on our shows and we'll have all the links to all that stuff so yeah we'll be tweeting all that stuff out too yeah you betcha so guys um thank you very much for joining wish you well can't wait to watch this project evolve um thanks so much again for taking the time and and discussing this with us yeah thanks so much we had a great time yeah good well thanks everyone for listening make sure you check these guys out it's it's uh It's going to be great. So take care. Peace out. Tip your waitress.